Welcome back, friends, to another episode of Liminal Frames. It's our 50th episode, and we're excited to be with all of you, uh, the frameies, the framers, the uh, framenites, the friends, uh, framenals. I don't think we heard that one, but I thought that was kind of fun. Um, homies. Wait, I don't know if that was right or not. Uh, borderlanders, I recall one of those as well. A lot of great suggestions out there for what we might call ourselves uh, in the liminal frames community. And, you know, I like to think that all of them work because uh, we're in that liminal space, there, and we're not really in a settled or unsettled space at all. We're constantly in flux. So whatever name you feel best suits you for this uh, particular episode or all the episodes, feel free to take on. And perhaps we'll find new names as we move forward together as well. But it's great to be back with you celebrating episode 50. Man, Darren, I didn't think we'd uh, get this far so soon, but here we are. It's exciting to be doing the show. Uh, how have you been? And uh, I guess today was kind of a huge day, which we're going to get into really shortly. Yeah, I heard something drop. I'm not sure what it was. Of course, I'm joking. We had this arrow report drop, of course. Uh, yeah, episode 50. That is a milestone to celebrate for sure. I remember when... Earlier on, you'd be like, wow, Darren, it's episode 12. It's episode 17. This is big. And we stopped doing that. And now here we are suddenly at 50. And I remember saying that I was confident we would get to the triple digits. And that's why when I list them, I have like 010011 uh, because I was confident we would hit number 100. We are halfway there. Something to celebrate for sure. Love it. Uh, yeah, the bass drop today in the UFO community. That's, uh, that's what I heard. Uh, the... Uh, the report we've all been waiting on, that report on the historical record of U.S. government involvement with unidentified anomalous phenomena, otherwise known as UAP, Volume 1, which on this report was stated as delivered in February, which, uh, I don't know, by my watch, Darren, it's March. So a little bit late in the delivery, which I guess we expected. And the buzz about this report certainly turned out to be true. Uh, it uh, definitely downplayed every... Uh, you know, sort of rumor about the government's involvement with UAP back engineering versus engineering, uh, the, the you know, sort of legacy of secrecy around UAPs. Uh, it was a quite detailed report in some, in some ways. I mean, we didn't get a, 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 five, a few pages. We got 63 pages of material so that there is some substance here. In fact, I found it kind of interesting to see uh, the detail that they did put in about, you know, each claim that they investigated and the different programs that they reviewed. So there's a lot of, you know, kind of good material here uh, to comb through, but good only from the sense of it's good to in, in a, to dissect it or, uh, you know, I think tear it apart to some degree. Uh, but let me read really quickly kind of the top level executive summary from section two. And I think that really sums it up quite nicely. So it says, Arrow found no evidence that any U.S. government investigation, academic-sponsored research, or official review panel has confirmed that any sighting of a UAP represented extraterrestrial technology. Um, so, and they put this in bold italics, and this this comes up quite often in the report. Uh, this no empirical evidence uh, that that phrase is used quite a lot. Um, it's it's an interesting read to say the least. So. I know the community has been a buzz today with uh, what with the contents of this. Uh, interestingly, maybe not surprising at all, there were at least I know seven mainstream media articles all published today as well about the report. Uh, not surprisingly, almost all of them sort of touting the same party line here that there's nothing to see here. That this UFO hunter basically found you know absolutely nothing to these claims. So we can just sort of put this to rest once again. It all feels quite very familiar to uh, stories that we've heard in, in the UFO lore and history before you were in I time. Um, but here we are again. Time seems to repeat itself. Yeah, it's funny seeing some of the community's response because there's a lot of frustration puts it mildly, right? Rage might be more mm. descriptive. But to your point, this is kind of what we were expecting. We've known for a while now this is kind of like Project Blue Book all over again when you have the DOD basically handling their own investigation, unless they have feet you know, brought to the fire, they're not going to tell on themselves, basically. And as we talked about before we went on the air, the secrets are so consequential, and this stretches into so many different parts of our history as a, as a nation over the last 100 years at least, that you know they just don't want to leave open any room for this to be discussed further. So I think some people were hoping for a few 
quarters of light coming out of the door that mm. could lead to greater investigation later. They certainly weren't expecting it to be cracked open entirely, but they were surprised, I think, at what this is, which is basically trying to drop the coffin in the ground, shut the door, put the dirt on top for it never to be resurrected again. That's what they are hoping for. Of course, to any of us watching, just even in a sense that there's two competing narratives now within different branches of our government saying completely different things about what's going on here and how much evidence there is, suggests that something's not adding up here. So clearly, as some people have pointed out on social media, they are scrambling at this point, right? They are hoping this will put this to death, but it's not going to. That's very clear. This is only going to embolden further the whistleblowers who do know about these things. They're going to find ways to get this out one way or another, come hell or high water. And we're back at that catastrophic disclosure term again, right? Like mm -hmm. that could be what's in place. Seems like that's the only way this is going to come forward. And that's what a lot of people are saying too. But again, I just think that part of the reason why the only option they see, I'm talking about the gatekeepers see as being viable here, is to try to shut the whole thing down once and for all, or at least for the foreseeable future, because they're scrambling for their lives, basically, because the implications are so dire. This goes to criminal activity. It goes to a misconstruing of our history. It goes to questions around, as I said to you before on the air, the exchange of technology in order to look the other way while American citizens are being abducted, these kinds of things, right? This is not what they want to get out. There's no way to let some of it out without letting the whole Pandora's box sort of open up. So that's where I see us at, and I'm not that surprised. Yeah, it's a bit of uh, the fox guarding the hen house, really, and that comes through quite clearly. I, I think we're in an interesting time now, as you hinted at, that our our people and our and our, even our elected representatives are a lot more uh, skeptical of statements from the government, from the Pentagon, regarding pretty much anything. I mean, we all know they didn't uh, pass an audit. They they can't pass an audit of their financial uh, re resources over many years. Um, that's just one reason among many. Uh, we can point to many instances in, in the history of the organization where it's come to light well after the fact that they weren't being straight with the American people. So you kind of build on that that uh, legacy of obfuscation or misdirection, and, and here you are. It's going to be very interesting to see what Congress does next, because we've heard from folks like Christopher Mellon and from Ross Coulthard that there are uh, senators and Congress people who have been uh, briefed very in very uh, great detail on some of these programs, that they've met with some of these whistleblowers directly, that in fact many of them have bypassed arrow all together and gone directly to these senators to present their evidence. So it's going to be quite interesting to see the reaction from the Congress to this report. Are they going to keep pushing on this? Are they going to say, well, I guess uh, there really is nothing to see here, so let's just put this to bed and move on with our lives. Um, to me, that, that's what I'm looking for in the coming days and months. Also, of course, I'm looking to see if there are any additional whistleblowers who do step forward. I think as many folks uh, on UFO Twitter today uh, pointed out, I mean, that's really kind of what we need now. You know, we're, we're, we're still at a bit of an impasse. Um, this is a very, I think, to an outsider looking in at the UFO community, this report uh, stands a very strong position you know, to the general public saying there's really nothing here. I mean, in fact, I got an email from my dad this morning with a New York Times article you know, essentially saying, like, here you go. Maybe there's nothing to this. So that's what most people are going to take away from the, this report. And so what will we see happen next in response to it? If we don't get any hard evidence, and I don't just mean kind of a secondhand claim or, you know, that I submitted something and you'll have to take my word for it. We got to get some tangible proof that there is a program or something going on here. That's going to be the next uh, big shoe to drop, in my opinion. Agreed. And for the general public, whatever evidence has come forward is mostly anecdotal in the sense of, again, to use sort of like a Kirkpatrick expression, you know, somebody heard it from their cousin that they saw something, right? Uh, so I can understand how some people are skeptical until they see more, right? They want to have more than just hearsay or someone said they heard something. Yes, and we will see when we, for instance, think back to the 2017 article the release of the videos was a key part of that data dump, right? It would not have had the impact it did if not for those videos. McWest aside and all that in terms of uh, birds parading like UFOs. But another piece I wanted to touch on was the op-ed that Kirkpatrick published just prior to this uh, report. And it's so brazen in terms of how he completely mocks 
the UFO community and basically throws the congressional committees under the bus too and says that they've been fooled by these conspiracy theorists who've watched too much sci-fi basically. And he even went so far as to say that if we keep listening to these conspiracy theorists, if you Congress people keep being fooled by these people, we're going to end up accidentally exposing some top secret U.S. military program and that will do harm to our nation. So it's almost like scolding and saying, don't do this. Not only are you silly, but you're going to do something bad in the process. Again, all with the aim of shutting this down. But one of the revelations that came forward today from Ross Coulthard was that the very advisory board that Sean Kirkpatrick put together during his investigation at Arrow involved the very gatekeepers who are responsible for these craft retrieval reverse engineering programs. So at that point, it becomes a complete farce, of course. And I would argue that the degree to which Kirkpatrick is not only just towing the party line and trying to look like an objective observer, he's doing much more than that. He's basically trying to ridicule and dismiss and bury the counter narrative, the counter argument. That to me suggests that he is not just a pawn, that somehow he's, he's a willing player. And the fact that this factual evidence, apparently, that Coulthard claims he has, suggesting that he actually had an advisory board made up of these gatekeepers, tells me that it's, again, the DOD covering their own tracks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, I, I sort of uh, posted today about a section on the report, page 38, about perceived deception along the lines of what you're talking about, that you know the report uh, highlights that there's a conviction among some Americans that the government has conducted a deception operation to conceal that this has been going on. And they say one of the reasons why this may have been, why this perception of deception has been promulgated is that two of the uh, sort of leading UFO investigators for, gov- for the government's own programs, here you, they cite J. Allen Hynek from Project Blue Book and also Captain uh, Ruppelt, who is the first chief from Project Blue Book, but also was involved with other projects to investigate the UFO phenomenon, both basically came out after their tenures in these programs and stated that they were told to tamp down any uh, you know sort of claims that they were to debunk everything that they were only to to sort of preach the party line from the U.S. Air Force. So you know you have statements like that in this report that really stood out to me as quite uh, perplexing because it's it's very clear that there is a history of speaking out of both sides of your mouth here. And so, uh, you know, doesn't that raise further questions as to what might really be going on? And I feel like there's a lot of digging left to be done to really get to the heart of what's going on here. On top of that, look, we've had decades of these reports. And and uh, it's not that uh, all of these people just happen to be seeing, you know, strange weather phenomena over the years. Some of the sightings are very close, very clear. Uh, they have been documented very thoroughly. There's not a lot of commentary here about you know, the the Nimitz incident, which I think is still considered to be an unresolved incident, which would in its in and of itself be quite alarming. So it's this is all meant, I guess, to paint a picture that maybe there is an emergent technology out there that uh, we still need to be concerned with, but it's certainly not ours. We just don't know who it happens to be, even though we know that China itself has also announced their own, uh, you know, concern about UAP, their own UAP investigative body. So it's a it's. It leaves a lot of open questions. I don't think we're, we're, we're done with this by any means. And uh, I know the community is really more riled up than ever to try to push this forward. Yeah, and I would just say, as I said to you before we were going on the air here, that there's so much low-hanging fruit here that if we had any kind of journalistic commitment and integrity uh, in our country and around the world, so much of this could be picked apart because just like you said, there's aspects in the report itself that beg the question, right? That speak out of both sides of the mouth kind of thing. On top of that, you know, you've got these cases, like I've got a couple of quotes here, and this speaks to what I mentioned before with the way that Kirkpatrick would frame things. He sets it up in such a way as to say, we were able to identify such and such, and it leaves the implication there that one day we'll be able to do that with all of them, right? It's just a matter of having enough data and having enough time and crunching the numbers and that kind of thing. And again, we remember when he said his goal is to make all of these somebody else's problem And what he means by that is take them out of this mythology of being extraterrestrial craft and actually much more terrestrial issues that we then need to deal with in the appropriate sort of military group. But this is one of those quotes. Quote, in the last month, we closed about 122 cases that were reported to Aero. 68% of those we assessed to be some form of what I call Aero garbage, (laughs) balloons, trash that's up there in the atmosphere, 
their advanced sensors were able to detect, Phillips said. So again, the implication there is that once we actually look at this stuff, we just find out it's something pretty prosaic. They may not be seeing swamp gas or Saturn this time around, but you know now we've got drones and balloons. These are the new things that are replacing it. And if there's any kind of anomaly left open, when you think about the way that Kirkpatrick addressed that in the, on the op-ed, he basically said that what we might be seeing is signs of some sort of a leap that some terrestrial nation, an adversary nation may have made, and that's what we should pay attention to. So again, it's not just that he's saying nothing to see here, but he's actually building a counter narrative. Number one, that we're going to end up perhaps accidentally exposing top secret US tech, and that's not good. And number two, that with these silly arguments about ETs coming from Alpha Centauri, we're missing the fact that China or Russia or some other adversary has apparently developed some sort of leapfrog technology that is doing circles around us. So again, it's the shame and blame game, not just any kind of hope of looking like an objective observer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And clearly in both of those instances that you mentioned, we have evidence of a real technology, some sort of real object. Um, I find it interesting that uh, dissuading Congress from listening to whistleblowers leads to the revelation of certain black projects that tells me that some of these whistleblowers may in fact know what they're talking about. Uh, so it's a little bit strange to say that, uh, you know, that they're all just, you know, misled and crazy people. Um, so we're, we're certainly not done. This is, uh, this is really, it was a fascinating read. Encourage folks to read it, you know, take your time with it, talk about it with your, you know, family members, because I think it's going to come up. It was all over the news. People are going to be talking about this. Uh, but really, we're looking forward to whatever next revelation comes forward from those who are, you know, in the know, because I honestly think that's the only thing that's going to move this needle, you know, any, any further. Um, I think we've basically gotten the government's final say here, their official stance uh, for quite some time until volume two comes out, which I'm sure will be more of the same. Um, this is what this is the line that they're they're going to give. And as you pointed out, you know, early in the episode here. Um, for them to make kind of any uh, sort of a crack and, and claim that there could be something there, there's just so many questions that would come flooding out from that crack that they're really not quite prepared to address. So it may have to come in a catastrophic way. Uh, you know, consequences be damned. Absolutely. And just a couple other points to make. I would, again, help people understand that sometimes the way that they are able to make these apparently bold-faced lies these kind of statements is because they decide what counts as verifiable, for instance, or empirical. And then they take that really narrowly defined criteria and then say, yeah, nothing fits that, right? So we think about a previous episode where we talked about nothing that would fit the extraterrestrial signature. But then, of course, we don't have an extraterrestrial signature to compare it against. So that's always going to return zero hits, right? This is something Joe Khalil said of News Nation regarding the report. He said, quote, Pentagon spokesperson General Patrick Ryder says this, prefacing the report. To date, Arrow has found no verifiable evidence for claims. But again, I want to make the point, they are defining what verifiable is, and they're not telling us what verifiable is. So that allows them to sort of get around this. No verifiable evidence for claims that the U.S. government and private companies have access to or have been reverse engineering extraterrestrial technology. Again, as a quick aside, in the Schumer Amendment, they used non-human intelligence is using extraterrestrial here, a way of getting around what's actually a much more complex framing of what these beings are. Continuing the quote here, also, Arrow has found no evidence that any U.S. government investigation, academic-sponsored research, or official review panel has confirmed that any sighting of a UAP represented extraterrestrial technology, unquote. So again, we have extraterrestrial thrown in there, which could be, you know, meant to distract. And then we also have this, any U.S. government investigation, academic sponsored research. Again, they are defining what those things are, and they're not telling us what those things are. So they are playing the game and they're setting the rules of the game. Even yesterday, this was one of the most hilarious parts because they've actually been using language around transparency. But when they actually had this briefing, it was a hand-picked few that could show off. It wasn't open to everyone. And of course, it makes a complete farce of this notion that there's anything transparent about it. Again, this is an inside job. I don't think there's any way else to see it. But I think for both you and I, this is not that surprising. When you are guilty... And when the implications are so dire and stretch in so many directions, what else are you going to do? I think they're just hoping that they're buying time and they'll come up with some other 
strategy in the future, but until their hands are forced, and that might be through catastrophic disclosure, this is the game they're going to play. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're going to pivot from the report. Uh, we're not going to spend the whole show on that report, uh, although we certainly could. We're going to pivot from that to a book that we're both you know, big fans of. Uh, it's Meeting and Absurdity uh, from Bernardo Castrop. This book, to me, is a must-read if you want to know a little bit more about uh, the phenomena or how it might be uh, behaving and how it might intersect with our world. Uh, so I encourage folks to pick it up if they haven't read it. It's kind of dense material as well, Darren, like it, I think, warrants a couple of reads, to be honest. Uh, but we've got some quotes that we want to walk through as we sort of go through the the contents of the book and, and extrapolate out from some of the quotes, some of the ideas and how they might intersect with uh, our particular perspective on the phenomena. So uh, with that kind of preamble, uh, Darren, I'd love for you to kind of kick it off with um, with where you think we should start here. Sure. And I would just say a couple of things. You and I have discussed idealism a lot on this podcast. I remember when I first brought up the notion with you over coffee at Starbucks a couple of years ago, things have changed a lot since then. A lot's happened. And yet this way of conceiving of reality has proven really beneficial and fruitful. And there are different wrinkles that have come in since then. Some aspects of my thinking have changed over time, as I'm sure yours have as well. But this notion that mind may be central to reality, which again, of course, is what ancient Vedantic thought believed as well, is really compelling. And there's a remarkable amount of evidence suggesting this is the case. And actually, it's some of our assumptions, our intuitions that are incorrect that lead us to the false conclusions. And Bernardo has been a champion of idealism, of course, probably the chief proponent of it in the world. And of course, his Essentia Foundation is trying to fight the good fight and help us move away from something like physicalism to a much more redemptive kind of model of reality. Now, this particular book is also a book I stumbled across and was pretty influential even in the presentation I gave at the New York Anomalous Conference mm. a couple of years ago. And not many people had heard about it then. More people know about it now, but still I think it's kind of flying below the radar. To echo your point, no, this is definitely a must read. This is in my top five books, period in terms of ufology and understanding the phenomenon. So the full title is Meaning and Absurdity, What Bizarre Phenomena Can Tell Us About the Nature of Reality. Bernardo Castrop is the author. And yeah, it's only 114 pages long, but it's dense. So I've read it three times. I know you've read it at least twice. Definitely worth doing, especially because, to his point, much of what we assume is the case are intuitions. They're assumptions. And those are so baked in, and we've been propagandized around these our entire lives, that it actually takes quite a bit of rereading it, seeing it again, seeing it again, before you really begin to be able to separate out, parse out your experience from what he's saying here, right? And this is what the back cover of the book says, just to give people an idea of which direction he's planning to go here. This book is an experiment inspired by the bizarre and uncanny it is an attempt to use science and rationality to lift the veil off the irrational. Its ways are unconventional. Weaving along its path, one finds UFOs and fairies, quantum mechanics, analytic philosophy, history, mathematics, and depth psychology. The enterprise of constructing a coherent story out of these incommensurable disciplines is exploratory. But if the experiment works, at the end of these disparate threads will come together to unveil a startling scenario about the nature of reality. The payoff is handsome, a reason for hope, a boost for the imagination and the promise of a meaningful future. Yet this book may confront some of your dearest notions about truth and reason. Its conclusions cannot be dismissed lightly because the evidence this book compiles and the philosophy it leverages are solid in the orthodox academic sense, unquote. So a couple of things there. Yes, it's a strong academic argument. As Bernardo said to me in the conversation I had with him, even people who are still hardcore physicalists recognize it's a hard model to disagree with. And beyond that, what is interesting about this book, and we see it in the title, meaning in absurdity, this speaks to what Jacques Vallée was the first one to really point out, is that there's so much absurdity baked into this phenomenon. Why would that be the case? Of course, in that conversation I had with Bernardo, he actually brought up an experience he had as a 10-year-old, and he also clarified it was totally absurd. It didn't make any sense. 
And obviously that experience, even though he doesn't mention that in this book, it's only, I think in my podcast, was maybe the second time he'd ever mentioned it publicly, probably played into why he started going in this direction. Because he had to, as many of us do, we have experience personally, and then we have to reconcile what does this mean of reality. So when you first heard about this book, was it what you were expecting? Did he go in directions you were expecting? What did you think of it initially? Well, as you as you point out there, it was kind of a slog for me on the first pass because uh, you have to actively disengage the part of your mind that is used to thinking about the world in a certain way and and go into this more abstract, it's abstract to me, abstract way of, of understanding reality. And it takes time to really churn that over in your in your mind and, and, and get comfortable with the concepts to where they become as as similar and as close to you as as the as the the concepts of physicalism of which we're all born into. And so once you can kind of get past that barrier to where these concepts become similarly familiar, then then it becomes very enriching and enlightening and, and it opens you up to a whole new way of looking at at the world. So I, I say that because if you're picking it up and you, and you want to dive right into it, don't be discouraged if you have if you're having a difficult time kind of getting through it on the first pass. I, I, quite frankly, I would say that's perfectly normal. Uh, you know, try to underline some things that jump out at you, reread some things, come back back to them again, and and take some time off in between readings and, and then return. There's also a lot of really good content, as you pointed out, uh, on the Essentia Foundation's YouTube channel. Uh, including like a six-part uh, series on idealism that he offers. So there's a, a ton of material out there to help folks grok this concept. But once you do, it really does begin to unlock elements of the phenomena in very meaningful, very powerful ways. And it it, 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 it certainly doesn't simplify things. It actually makes it much more complex. But I would argue that complexity introduces a richness to the phenomena that makes it even more personal, even more powerful and meaningful to the human experience. Indeed. And in addition to helping us unpack and parse out the phenomenon, again, I want to point people to the subtitle, which is what bizarre phenomena can tell us about the nature of reality. So the subtitle was not how can we understand the UFO phenomenon, but what does it tell us about the nature of reality? That's the part that's the most compelling, I think, and the most interesting is that this is not just about trying to find some way to fit the phenomenon within our conventional thinking, but actually to say the phenomenon is so anomalous and so well supported in terms of data that we should actually use it as a way to question whether or not our model is where we need to have some movement. So he does that. Of course, it wasn't the UFO phenomenon alone that led him to idealism. He pointed out to me, as he has elsewhere, that he kind of inherited physicalism like all of us do. It was only when he really had to practice physicalism and when he was even working on AI and whether or not he actually could create a conscious computer, quote unquote, that he realized, no, you can't. And that also made him realize some implications about the nature of reality and that our understanding of it was faulty. And this led him back to idealism. So this is something I want to read from here in terms of these anomalous encounters that are absurd. And I also want to make the point here before we start that there's plenty of situations that are not particularly absurd. So you and I were discussing before we started recording that, for instance, in that more recent essay he's published around the Silurian hypothesis, basically in that essay, he says he thinks the high strangeness is another thing entirely. So he's positing that perhaps there's at least two elements here to this overarching phenomenon. One is the high strangeness, which he sort of gets into in this book, and we'll cover this time. And there's another thing which speaks to the craft and hangers and bodies and freezers somewhere. Because those are carbon-based bodies happening in what he perceives as our direct manifest reality, he actually prefers something like the Silurian hypothesis, the idea that they're ancient humanoids because they look so much like us, they look like they evolved on the earth. So it's interesting how he's landed at a pretty physical-based notion to explain that, but what he does with high strangeness is very, very different. But one of the absurd elements he does get into is this encounter that a guy named Joe Simington had. And I love this case because it's just so hilarious. It involves aliens that look a bit like Italians and that are cooking pancakes on some sort of grill and a UFO. I mean, I laugh almost every time I talk <laughs> about this case because it is so absurd in a way that's really laughable. All right, so let me, let me read this, and then he's going to get into what Valet said about this case. And again, to Valet's credit, 
He didn't shy away from these cases. Like Bernardo, he's saying, this is telling us something. We need to pay closer attention. Quote, springtime in North America. It's the 1960s. A man steps out of his house and comes face to face with a saucer-shaped object hovering above his yard. A hatch opens and the man sees three entities inside the craft. The supposed aliens are small and dark-skinned, like certain types of fairies. One of the entities holds up a jug to the man, a gesture the man interprets as a request for some water. Space aliens, able to fly undetected across solar systems, needing to stop by and reveal themselves to a man in order to fill up a jug of water? What is the logic of that? Nonetheless, the man obliges, filling the jug with water from inside his house. When he returns, he sees one of the entities inside the craft frying what appears to be food on a kind of grill. Upon taking note of the man's interest in their food, one of the entities hands the man three pancakes. Therefore, the entities <laughs> close the hatch. Thereafter, the entities close the hatch, take off, and disappear. Naturally, it would be easy to s- dismiss such a story as delusions of a pathological mind, especially given the fact that no physical evidence could be found upon further investigation. That is, except for the pancakes, which were sent by the United States Air Force for analysis at the Food and Drug Laboratory of the United States Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. While I recover from laughing here, I'll let you riff on that for a second. <laughs> I mean, how can you not laugh about that one? It's uh, absolutely absurd, quite perplexing, quite strange. Uh, there are, I don't know, very human elements to it. Like uh, this is almost like a backyard barbecue, but it's breakfast, making some breakfast. Uh, I mean, I get it. You know, you've taken a trip in the saucer. You want to take a breather, need some water, have some breakfast. Maybe it's a beautiful morning. Uh, somebody happens to stumble across your craft and... Hey, you've got some extras, so why not uh, share a little bit there? Um, yeah, the, the pancake story is is super strange. And I think the only thing that was weird about them, right, was that they, they didn't have any salt. Is that right? They, they were lacking salt, if I recall correctly. Indeed. In fact, I'm going to discuss that right now because this was one of the data points that led Valet in the direction he went. Quoting from later in the book, quote, Joe Simonton's case was analyzed and reported by respected French UFO investigator Dr. Jacques Valet in 1970. As it turns out, the pancakes that the aliens supposedly gave Joe were made of perfectly regular earthy ingredients. Puzzlingly, however, it did not contain any salt. As Valet stresses, Joe Simonton was considered a very reliable, sincere, and trustworthy man, this being the reason why even the Air Force took his original claim so seriously. Valet then goes on to compare Joe's experience with old fairy stories from Celtic folklore. As it turns out, There is a wealth of folk stories where the fairies either offer or ask for food. Interestingly, fairies never eat salt, unquote. What do you make of that? Well, I mean, they're obviously pretty concerned about their blood pressure. Uh, You don't want to get too much salt in the diet there. Um, Yeah, this is this is adds to the I think the the fascinating qualities of the story. And, you know, Jacques Vallée rightly pointing out the commonalities and similarities to our mythic folk folklore. There, there's a through line, in other words, between uh, these stories and myths from our past and modern day experiences that to us in the present day are quite inexplicable. And it also highlights to me the degree to which we've taken a very uh, like a provincial view of the past and we tend to put ourselves on a pedestal above our, our forebearers because what do they really know about reality? What do they really know about the world and of science? We're, we're these enlightened beings and, and look at these silly stories that they concocted. So it, uh, it opens the door to saying, wait a minute, maybe there's more to these stories than I previously thought. And that's really, I think, a good indicator of where Bernardo is trying to go here. Yeah, that's a very insightful observation because indeed it's easy enough to dismiss those as the ramblings of unscientific people who didn't know any better, maybe it had too much vodka or beer or something. When we have someone like Joe Simonton, again, what's compelling about his case, and Bernardo noted this, is that even the Air Force took him seriously because in terms of how he was regarded by his neighbors, by his community, he was considered a very trustworthy witness in every other area. And if you were going to make up a story, would you make up this story? about aliens that look like dark-skinned Italians frying pancakes and asking for water to make it back to Neptune or whatever. It doesn't make any sense. In fact, 
there have been different researchers, including Valet, I think, who said that if a story is too like science fiction-esque in its parameters, he tends to doubt it. It's the bizarre, it's the weirdness that actually tends to be the most credible in his mind. So again, this is interesting. And to your point, indeed, the 1960s, not the 7th century or the 14th century, this is relatively recent as someone having this experience that brings to mind stories about fairies and their dislike for salt and their care for their bodies, as you point out. (laughs) So very, very interesting. And it makes us face forward with this data. It makes us say, it's not sufficient to say our forebearers just didn't have scientific minds and that was their problem. When we are faced with this, where a modern person with a scientific understanding in modern day America is having this experience, something's going on. What's interesting about Bernardo's take is that he would actually begin to open up the possibility that rather than fairies being kind of like crypto terrestrials that are just hiding in caves within physical reality, he breaks into this notion that there's a a porous boundary between the subjective and the objective and the collective unconscious and the manifest reality we usually experience. And that's why we get some of this absurdity. And I think that's a really compelling argument because it's hard to make sense of these absurd elements otherwise. What do you think about that particular point? Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Uh, we we have to have a, from my perspective, we have to have a very, uh, in, in, take a more encompassing view of of you know, the experiences of humans throughout history. And I think we've, we've done a poor job of that. We tend to believe that we, uh, you know, when we come into the world, the world has uh, sort of progressed from where it, where it was before us. And the knowledge that we receive at the time we arrive is the pinnacle of knowledge and the pinnacle of understanding. And we, we have a tendency to denigrate the knowledge of, of humans in the past uh, you know, and certainly to kind of laugh at them in many ways, uh, you know, in their in their silly beliefs. And I, for me, finding a model that really looks at that human experience from a respectful vantage point is much more redeeming. And if we can if we can find one that achieves that, then then think of what we've done there. We've 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 really brought back into our collective sense of who we are a a, a not only a respect. But a, a love for the human family and an appreciation, you know, for, for our way of, of experiencing reality um, instead of just kind of taking this historical, uh, you know, looking down the nose perspective, you know, we're, we're taking a more redemptive, holistic approach. And, you know, for me, a, a metaphysic and a philosophy that achieves that is one that we should be championing. Absolutely. And as I've been saying for a while now, rather than asking how the UFO phenomenon fits into our model of reality – we should be asking, what is the nature of reality such that something like the UFO phenomenon can exist? And in addition to that, all of the other points of convergence, near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, psi phenomena, apparition, all those kind of things. So yeah, so let's jump into now chapter two in this book, which we're going to sort of, sort of walk through how Bernardo builds his case here. And Bernardo is very complimentary of Jacques Vallée. He feels like Jacques Vallée was the first person to really take us in the right direction. Reading from chapter two here, Quote, investigators of calls of the absurd have systematically sought rational explanations for these phenomena. The underlying assumption was so self-evident it hardly needed to be made explicit. Whatever the phenomena were, their causes had to be rooted in logic and physics. Hint, people, that's what Bernardo's going to question here. Quoting again, thus the most elusive evidence and the most absurd testimonies those that demonstrably required a violation of the established laws of physics to hold true, or which were nonsensical on the face of it, could be nothing but fabrications or delusions and were therefore dismissed. It was not until the 1970s that Jacques Vallée realized that it was precisely the elusiveness of certain pieces of evidence and the absurdity of certain reports, the violation of physics and common sense they implied, that rendered them most interesting for study. He understood that if these reports were not outright lies, then their significance was considerable. Vallée is the true pioneer of the empirical study of the absurd as something beyond psychology, the first to open the door to a whole new way of thinking about strange observations of the world, quote-unquote, out there. Our culture may, in the not-so-distant future, have much to thank Vallée for, unquote. And of course, he's getting there at this question of, is there something out there that's apart from what's in us and what we are? 
that's where he's going with that. But what's your initial thought about his way of framing the lay being such a pioneer, such a trailblazer for this field? Well, I mean, he deserves that praise, in my opinion, uh, because it took a lot of courage to take that perspective and, and highlight that these absurd events maybe are part of the answer. Uh, you know, instead of taking an approach that says, well, I've never experienced this, and this this is so absurd that nobody would, would in their right mind, agree that this actually happened. Instead of taking that particular perspective, he's he's posing the question, being brave enough to pose the question, what if this is true? And I think that that's really quite fascinating and took, it just took a lot of courage to go there because the, the, uh, the forces at work to kind of push against that perspective are incredibly strong. So kudos to Valet. Uh, he rightly, you know, champions this uh, perspective that, that he took. And I think, you know, he's using this in a very, very creative way to then bring forth his argument, you know, for... Uh, why the absurd becomes so important in our understanding of reality itself. Indeed, in in this podcast on Point of Convergence and many in ufology have discussed one of the most famous aspects of Valet's thinking, and that's the control system hypothesis. This is interesting because Bernardo also spoke to me about this in our conversation, where he actually thinks that like an AI system, sometimes we are too set on a certain way of seeing reality and only additional data anomalous data is going to bump us out of that way of seeing things that's too limiting. And because we are lazy and because we like closure, our species specifically, his point is that this anomalous data is required to bump us out of our complacency around the way we see reality. And Valet was saying the same thing in terms of his control system, that what was maybe less important was what was happening, but more in total, how was it changing us as a species? And that maybe we are missing the forest for the trees by looking so closely at these specific incidents, which, by the way, were very easily dismissible because they are so outrageous and illogical, etc., that they can change us without us being aware that it's changing us. That's the key. So this is the part about the control system that kind of works at the fringes of our awareness and therefore can control the entire trajectory of human civilization without us being aware of it. This is what Bernardo says about that. Quote, Perhaps the most controversial of Valet's conclusions is that there is a purpose behind the occurrence of these strange phenomena. Having tried in vain to find a closed, sensible, logical explanation for UFOs for many years, Valet concluded that the right question to ask was not where the UFOs came from, but what effect they were causing. This latter question could be answered empirically based on relatively straightforward research. His conclusion? The calls of the absurd are leading to a shift in human consciousness and our conception of reality. He empirically observed a seeming schedule of reinforcement that works to cement this shift over time. Nonetheless, Valet left open whether such a shift is caused by premeditated action, by an intelligent agency, or whether it is simply the result of natural laws yet to be discovered. Unquote. Over to you. Yeah, that, that's quite interesting that he he did leave it open in that regard, um, because you know there are many in the community that they, they tend to take the position that this control process is very self directed by non human intelligence. But to to leave it open is to say you know maybe this could be some sort of fundamental quality of reality itself, not that it's just coming from other actors who happen to intersect with us somehow that it's kind of baked into the system, I mean, that is also a pretty uh, bold claim to make and, and, a, and a different way of thinking about the problem, certainly a different way than we classically think about the problem. If things are happening, then someone's making them happen as opposed to is this experience really a quality of reality itself? Is it is it baked into the entire enterprise? I mean, that's a huge question with, with no easy answers. Indeed, and... We still in modern day tend to think of ourselves not only as little units of consciousness disconnected from each other, but we assume we are disconnected from the larger biome. And one of the arguments that Bernardo makes is that there's these different porous layers to this sort of layer cake, if you imagine, and that it's only the very top icing that we are sort of accounting for. And we are looking for, to your point, perhaps outside agents that are coming in and controlling things where it might be part of the recipe of the cake itself. And in that sense, we can't even say that we are separate from that either. Like it really provokes really interesting questions about the nature of reality and who we are. Of course, this brings to mind, as I've said before, 
ancient Vedantic thought, Eastern cosmologies around the sense that we are ultimately source consciousness, sort of embedded within layers of identity. And so it kind of speaks to the same kind of notion. Now, going from Valet, he also then gets into John Mack's experience and how he tried to make sense of this entire thing. And I've heard a lot about this from firsthand people who were with John at the time. And it's fun to think back to what that must have been like, because, again, this was being thrust on our society. The abduction phenomenon seemed to peak around the 1990s. He was suddenly encountering these people who, as far as he could tell, were completely convincing, who were sincere, who were not delusional, who were having these bizarre experiences. But again, the anomalous aspects of the kind of reality scape that they were happening within made him really question whether... This was not something we just needed to fit into our model, but whether our model was insufficient. So let me quote from the book again. Quote, Decades after Valet began his investigation into UFOs and other related phenomena, Harvard's Dr. John Mack became interested in the so-called alien abduction phenomenon. As a psychiatrist, his original interest likely had psychological motivations. However, having failed to uncover a purely medical explanation for the reports of his patients, Dr. Mack ventured carefully into the territory of speculative ontology. His observations were uncannily consistent with Valet's own. He talks of the concurrently psychic and objective nature of the phenomenon, as well as its elusiveness. He speaks of a third zone that violates the boundaries between the subjective world of mind and the objective world of matter out there. Sounds like a liminal frame to me. Carrying on, he even suggests that the phenomenon is designed, not necessarily in a teleological sense, but rather in a compensatory and spontaneous manner to break down the separation between subjective and objective worlds and to force the experiencers to confront the inadequacy of the worldviews they have hitherto held. He speaks of ontological shock as the mechanism by which the phenomenon forces an expansion of people's conception of reality towards a worldview where notions previously held to be absurd become intelligible. In interviews he conducted with shamans from pre-literary cultures of Africa and South America, Dr. Mack asked whether the alien or fairy-like entities they claimed to have dealings with were supposed to be literal creatures or simply metaphors. He was then told that according to the worldviews of these pre-literary cultures, there was no difference between the two. Certainly a very counterintuitive reply for the Western mind to assimilate. Nonetheless, by the end of this book, it will hopefully become clearer what those shamans might have meant when they spoke of an identity between the literal and the metaphorical. Unquote. Over to you. Okay, this is really, really great stuff because we're getting to this point here in the discussion where we're starting to call into question our assumptions about reality, that there is an objective reality out there and that is separate from the subjective reality that we have in our inner life. And this is the direction that, that Castrop is beginning to, to veer into. And you know what I find interesting about that as a sort of particular commentary is that we've, we've, we've championed objective reality, what we call objective reality, so much that we have essentially... Uh, given our subjective experience, our, 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 our inner life, the, the boot, you know, and so we, we, we have, we have uh, sort of demoted the life of the mind and, 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 and told ourselves that the things that we think and the experiences that we have are less, somehow less valid, less meaningful, less uh, powerful than those things which we can objectively quantify, measure, et cetera. And, and what does that do? What does that position do to the human spirit? And I think we can only see now some of the, the ramifications, the repercussions of that stance of, of championing that for so many decades and centuries. Uh, we've got a place in our, in our current sort of state of affairs where you know, many people are, are really doubting their own sanity, right? Because they've been told to not trust the way that they experience the world. Uh, you know, today I was struck in particular by, not to go off on too much of a tangent here, but how much the experiencers might be feeling having been gaslit yet one more time, that all the things that they've gone through that were as real to them as, as this conversation is to us, 
uh, that, that those things didn't happen. And, and they're just flights of fantasy, uh, fancy. So it's, it's incredibly frustrating. And I think, you know, Mac is right to begin questioning the divide, this demarcation we have placed between what we call objective reality and subjective reality. That again, that's a paradigm we just decided to adopt. It doesn't have to be the way reality actually is. So to begin to kind of introduce these concepts and do that through the lens of Valet and then Mac here is really, really brilliant in my opinion. It is, and it's interesting because I remember hearing reports about when abductees back in the 90s were recounting their experiences, to your point, and how many people, even people who were open to this phenomenon, wanted to sort of say it was happening in a third realm, right? And even John initially wanted to entertain that idea. And as I pointed out in a couple of recent episodes, he actually sought out Thomas Kuhn because of his groundbreaking work around how scientific progress actually works to come up with some sort of way to frame this in a way that he could actually speak about it intelligibly in modern Western culture by taking on some of our assumptions, right? Some of our golden geese, if you will. And what's interesting is even some of this here, I think I would argue that Bernardo sometimes doesn't go far enough, that he would like to, for instance, have the bodies that are carbon-based and the craft and hangers be something like attributable to the Solarian hypothesis. And all of this is much more in these murky layers of reality. I think it's more complex than that even. And I remember hearing from one of the abductees, a friend of mine from the 90s, when they were having a conversation with Patrick Harper in his home in London back in the 90s. And this friend of mine was trying to make the point that this was not in some third realm. This was not in some other murkier layer of reality happening below the surface in a more substrate layer. She was saying this was as real as you and I having this conversation in front of your fireplace right now. So this just speaks to how even these pioneers like Belay, Patrick Harper, and to some degree Bernardo have been open to this, but still want to put it in a certain realm of reality or a certain kind of safe place, even for sociologists and religious scholars to think about we're actually, yeah, I think it, it calls into question even the surface layer and what actually can happen there. So that's interesting when I think about that. We have a ways to go yet in terms of what that ultimately means. But where he's going from here is, to your point about physicalism, and I just want to quickly say, you know, highlighting what you're saying there, that absolutely, not only have we gone down this track and assumed that it's the right way to go, but in the process, we've denigrated human experience and conscious experience and made it sound like some sort of superfluous, weird, anomalous thing that happens because of weird chemical firings in a brain, which is just a bunch of matter that happened to come together over time. And we haven't really wrestled with how defeating that is to the human psyche and what it does to humankind in general. You even think about the implications of physicalism in terms of the ins collective insanity we live under right now. Like, How much is that the product of a series of billions of people who've been told that nothing means anything, everything's purposeless, just achieve riches, do what you can, give what you can. In the eight or nine decades, you're here if you're lucky, and then it's all over. And the entire thing doesn't mean anything anyway. So at a deep, deeply subconscious level, even both as individuals and as collective, what does that do for our sense of making sense of our lives or even having any kind of purpose or direction to our lives? These are things we've barely begun to think about. All right, so let's jump then into this interesting notion that Bernardo jumps into that is one of the implications, again, of the quantum experiments that were done. We've said many times on this podcast that these experiments and the results they provided were so groundbreaking and so counterintuitive, even absurd, you might argue, that even today, many scientists try to sort of work around them or find some way that they were incorrectly interpreted or something, some error or a way that we're looking at it the wrong way, because again, our intuitions about physicalism being true, that there's a world out there that's distinct from what's in us, right? And what we are ultimately is so strong. But actually what the quantum experiments have shown is that even this notion of there being a real world, an objective world, to use your language, that's distinct from us is an illusion in itself. And he gets the, into that in chapter three, which is called the demise of realism. Quote, a common characteristic of many interpretations of the absurd, as discussed in the previous chapter, 
is a blurring of the boundaries between the inner reality of the psyche and the outer reality of the physical world. Indeed, the alleged dichotomy between subjectivity and objectivity, which reigns supreme in our culture, seems to be the major stumbling block in any attempt to make sense of the phenomena I have referred to as calls of the absurd. After all, if this alleged dichotomy were not framing our thinking, we would recognize mind and world to be essentially continuous with each other. So it would not be surprising at all that physicality is just as non-literal, symbolic, and metaphorical as our nightly dreams. But by separating world from mind, we have rendered this otherwise natural insight, which traditional cultures consider so self-evident, that they fail to understand the distinction we make between literal and metaphorical. Utterly unacceptable. Our culture has gotten away with this so far because, since the transition from the Renaissance to the Enlightenment in about the 17th or 18th century, we have simply chosen to ignore certain classes of phenomena in defining our mainstream worldview. Now, here he's going to get into the nature of what we mean by objective, and this is really key. Quote, But before we continue with our reasoning, we must lay out some semantic foundations for the sake of clarity. I am speaking here of the qualifier objective, quote-unquote, which we tend to use in two different ways. Almost always, these two different meanings are consistent with one another, so we do not even realize that we are saying two different things. But in the discussion that follows, we will need to make that distinction explicit and clear. We say that something is, quote-unquote, objective, when the thing observed is not the product of someone's individual imagination. If the thing is objective in this sense, then multiple observers will describe it in similar and consistent ways. Furthermore, this kind of objectivity entails that an individual observer is incapable of independently changing the reality of what is observed. For instance, an imaginary tree on the screen of someone's mind is not objective, for the person can change or destroy the tree at will simply by manipulating his or her own mental processes. Moreover, an imagined tree cannot be observed by multiple people. On the other hand, a physical tree in the garden is objective in this sense because, try as one might, the tree is still there even when one attempts to visualize something else in its place. This is the first sense in which we use the qualifier objective. Let us call this weak objectivity. Something is weakly objective when it can be consistently observed by multiple individuals and when it cannot be independently altered by an individual act of cognition. The other quality we attribute to something by saying that it is objective, quote-unquote, is its independence of conscious observation in general. Thus, if a meteorite can be said to have fallen in the middle of the remotest desert, even though no living creature has seen, heard, or otherwise perceived anything associated with this event, then we can say that the meteorite's fall is strongly objective. Something is strongly objective when its existence or occurrence is fundamentally independent of conscious observation. Unquote. Over to you. Okay, these are uh, two really key uh, distinctions that he's making and, and continues to come back to in the book. So I'm really glad that you read those passages in, in full. Uh, it, you know, just to kind of further kind of drive home the point here, you know, this weekly objective concept is where you know, we are experiencing something. We have some sort of conscious experience of it. But the strongly objective uh, claim is that the, that an object exists without any uh, conscious perception of it, that it exists independent of conscious awareness. And, and strong objectivity is essentially the position that you know, most kind of physicalists have taken, that they're you know, there are these uh, sort of quantized bits of matter that exist, whether you or I are observing them or not. They just happen to be, you know, doing their thing out in the real world, and uh, we we can we can observe them, but most of the time we just don't we don't see them. But nevertheless, they're they're all the same. So that that is kind of the the strongly objective uh, position. I think most people are pretty much familiar with that and would agree that that's generally the way they understand the world to function. But I know he's going to go on into talking about how that particular position seems to fall apart in the face of uh, some of the experiments from quantum mechanics. Indeed, and just to highlight what you're saying there, even Einstein, I think it was, famously is said to have been walking with a friend at night one time and pointed up to the moon and said, you really believe that's not there when we're not looking? Right, so Einstein famously really struggled with the revelations of the quantum experiments. 
and really tried to come up with a way that they were wrong, even some of the implications of his own research, he called into question, just because, again, not because it wasn't supported by the data, but because it didn't fit with his intuition of the way the world worked, and in his mind, how God would have made the universe. What we learned in later decades was actually his theory was completely right, and that his even questioning of his own theory was because of his biases, because of his intuitions again. And this is what Bernardo is really highlighting. And to your point in the beginning of this conversation, it does take a while to begin to even see the pair of glasses you're wearing. That's what's going on here is that we have to be shocked into awareness almost, which speaks again to what we discussed earlier in the earlier part of the book, where this notion of ontological shock is so particularly impacting in terms of blowing open people's worldviews. I've spoken to people who dealt with people who've been through major trauma, the kind of trauma you would not wish on your worst enemy. And the one thing that is true of all of those is that they, while horrible to go through in many ways, also seem to open up the possibility of a true transformational shift in a way that almost nothing else does. Most people tend to sort of incrementally grow and move through life. But to make a massive shift like that, it takes some sort of incredible inertia. And shock tends to be one of those things. Trauma tends to be one of those things. Of course, one of the questions that John really dealt with was, was the ontological shock, and this sort of gets to the control system notion, just an implication of seeing really weird looking creatures that shouldn't exist according to what you've been told? Or was the ontological shock partly used to induce the kind of cracking open that could force a new way of seeing things. And again, when you think about how many experiences have had this sense of some sort of foreboding about something coming that's massive, that if we don't change our trajectory, then we're in for a really difficult circumstance, that maybe these beings felt like we needed to really crack open humanity's way of seeing things. And if they didn't, then it would be our own demise. And so this is one of the arguments for the notion that the ontological shock was actually used for the sake of this transformational capacity. It's definitely interesting to think about, again, in light of what Bernardo points out, which is our remarkable stubbornness when it comes to our models. That even, as you and I have pointed out before, even after we've seen time and time and time again that our scientific models end up being eclipsed by a new way of seeing the world, we still go around assuming the one we have now is the right one, that we're the 99% percentile of the pinnacle understanding of reality itself. All right, so let's jump into more of this question about objectivity. Quoting from, again, this chapter, The Demise of Realism, quote, the inevitable question arising in anyone's mind upon reading chapter one of this book is, are these calls of the absurd real? Because if they are not real in the sense that they are not delusional or mere fabrications, then this entire book is pointless. Above, we have answered half of this question, Yes, calls of the absurd are real insofar as they are weakly objective. In other words, they are real to the people who jointly witness them and cannot be explained as individual delusions or fabrications. But we are now left with the other half of the question. Do these calls of the absurd exist outside mentation? Are they strongly objective as well? Any discussion about the strong objectivity of calls of the absurd is secondary in view of a much broader question. Is strong objectivity a property that can be confidently attributed to any aspect of nature at all? Can anything at all be said with certainty to be strongly objective? This is the question that has been asked by thinkers since time immemorial. Much has been written about it, therefore to continue with our analysis properly, we must place it in a broader historical and philosophical context. The notion of strong objectivity corresponds to what is known in the philosophy of science as realism. Realism is a philosophy holding that nature is independent of cognition. According to realism, the facts of nature are all already out there, quote unquote, from the beginning, just waiting for human beings to discover them. Historically, realism has been contrasted with the philosophy of idealism, which holds that the world is a construct of mind. Many scientists have an instinctive dislike of idealism because it may seem to imply that scientific discoveries are not discoveries at all, but self-validating inventions of human cognition. Still, scientists themselves accept that all we can ever experience as human beings is bundles of sense data in our mind, 
never the external world where the sense data supposedly originate. We have no direct access to a supposedly external world and no way to prove its existence. We are forever locked in the subjective space of our consciousness. Therefore, a mind-independent world remains an assumption, tempting as it may be. What drives this temptation is the consistency with which different people seem to describe the world. After all, we all seem to agree on what the world looks like. For there to be such commonality of description, at least one of the following two hypotheses must hold. Either A, we are all observing the same strongly objective world, or B, our minds are fundamentally connected to one another, so we can all share the same quote-unquote dream. Now, because there is an empirical correlation between minds and brains, realists implicitly assume that brains generate minds. And since brains are clearly separate from one another, realists then argue that minds must also be separate from one another, and hypothesis B must be discarded. All we are then left with is A, thereby proving realism correct, or so the argument goes. There is, however, a fundamental flaw in this line of reasoning. It begs the question. In other words, for the argument to work, it must assume the very hypothesis it seeks to prove. Indeed, the idea that minds are circumscribed by brains entails realism to begin with, insofar as it assumes that brains are discrete mind-independent objects in the world that in turn generate minds. But if realism is not true, then brains must themselves be constructs of mind, in mind, not the other way around. In this case, the fact that different brains are separate from each other says nothing about the possibility that minds are connected or even unitary. As such, hypothesis B cannot be discarded. The entire argument for realism thus falls apart, and once again, we see that consistency of description can only be construed as evidence for weak objectivity, not realism. For all we know, we may all be having a shared dream, unquote. Yeah, that's a that's a mouthful there, but really important. Uh, you know, if you if you need to listen to that segment again, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that because there's a lot of uh, material there to to digest. But incredibly important material, you know, essentially making the the claim that I think is, you know, pretty easy to understand that at its fundamental level that everything that we experience, all data, all scientific measurement whatever you want to call as an experience of reality is all mediated through our conscious awareness. There's just no way around that. There's no way for us to independently verify the uh, strong objectivity of, of, of things outside of, independent of our own mental process. Like it, everything that we observe has to occur in our m mental process. And so, you know, he's he's really calling that out as a as something that cannot be ignored, cannot be discarded. And if it cannot be discarded, what would it look like? And this is where he goes from here. What would it look like if we built a framework on on that conception rather than the other one? So it's it's a simpler concept to say that that matter is a byproduct of mind, not the not the opposite. And what if we start from that premise rather than the other way around? Yeah, it's a very compelling point he makes, and what he's really exposing <clears throat> is our commitment, our unconscious commitment to our assumptions, like you say. And what's interesting is when he gets into debates with people, and I've seen this sometimes, what's remarkable is they'll say things, his opponents will say things like, well, since we know consciousness comes from brain, and then they go on to make you know point B and point C, and he's like, well, hold on. Your first premise there assumes that physicalism is, is the case. And this is the point he's making there, that you have to kind of have circular reasoning to even make sense of these things. And to your point, and this is what he's sort of getting to in terms of the implications for science and physics and everything, is that because we can never separate our own conscious experience of the world from the observations and the experiments we're conducting, there's no way we can, we can know the difference. And again, to bring in our friend Donald Hoffman, he would say that actually what physics is, is the basically the study of the observational aspect of our beingness, that what we're actually measuring is the interface that has been constructed to the process of evolution to allow us to navigate through an incredibly complex barrage of data that would be completely overwhelming 
and largely nonsensical uh, if we had to deal with it. And partly what Bernardo is pointing out here is that some of these absurdities that make their way into our experience are some of those outliers, maybe outside of the usual evolutionarily derived interface that's allowed. So it's very interesting when you think about the implications. But before I read this next section, yes, to highlight what Nathan said there, you might want to rewind that and listen to it again, just because it really is hard to grasp at first. But once you see it, you see it. It's kind of like one of those illusions where within this blurry waves, you suddenly see an object once you can sort of unfocus your eyes. It's like that. You have to unfocus the way you have seen things to see what's been there all along. So where does this take us? This is what he gets into the next section here. Still in this chapter, The Demise of Realism. Quote, Although the worldview of the majority of people today, scientists and laymen alike, entails the belief that the world exists out there, independent of mind, this is but one alternative. The other alternative, idealism, has never been defeated as the basis for a viable worldview. In fact, idealism is much more parsimonious alternative, for it makes no assumptions beyond acknowledging the existence of experience, the one undeniable truth about reality. Moreover, even if one refrains from taking a metaphysical position, anti-realism shows us that our realist models of nature are just metaphors. They are useful in practice for predicting the behavior of nature, but they should not be overinterpreted as providing us with a literal ontology of the world. We base the entire edifice of our realist materialist worldview on a foundation that, just like the cause of the absurd, is fundamentally metaphorical. The implications of this are shattering, and yet we as a civilization insist on going about our business in blissful and willful ignorance of these questions. So where does this leave us? Adopting an idealist worldview would certainly help us make sense of the cause of the absurd. Their simultaneously physical and psychological reality would cease to be a problem. For what we call physical would then be just a special modality of mental imagery. The physical world itself would be mental, in essence, akin to a collective dream. As such, nobody would take it literally, in the same way that nobody takes dreams literally. All aspects of the physical world would be symbolic, some logically so, some absurdly so, much like dreams can both be logical and absurd in their elements in their storylines." Um, that's great stuff right there. Uh, the you know he has this quote in, in italics that that you read. I want to just read it one more time. Uh, we base the entire edifice of our realist materialist worldview on a foundation that, just like the cause of the absurd, is fundamentally metaphorical. And I think that that's a really important point to make. That if you happen to be a realist, uh, you know, taking this position that you know, mind is a is a byproduct of of matter. That position itself is relying on a metaphorical structure to explain the nature of reality. And so you know you can't really, in other words, you can't escape the fact that the way in which we're going to describe the world is going to be uh, sort of couched in uh, me- me- metaphor. There's no we have no capability to explain the world as it truly happens to be. We're always going to have to use sort of approximations or symbolic language in order to get close to what the world may be like. Um, we can certainly make inferences about how the world truly is, and he goes on later in the book to talk about intuition and how that plays a role. But the the main point being that it's not a set in stone kind of thing. It's not a a binary. This is it, and this is it, this is what it is not. It is a fluid, symbolically dynamic way of of experiencing reality. Absolutely. And I really want to highlight his point about this being like a dreamscape, because as he points out, he actually makes this argument in the book, and I've made this argument before as well. He talks about lucid dreams and what we can gather from that experience. And I've talked about that as well, I think, on this podcast, that I've had lucid dreams. For instance, let me bring up this one again, where I became conscious in a dream. That's what the lucid dream aspect refers to. I became conscious that I was dreaming and then set about trying to examine the physicality of that space, if you will, that mental space, and found that, sure enough, the red brick of the school wall that I rubbed my hand against tore the surface of my skin. Then when I got down and examined a blade of grass up really close, it looked like a blade of grass, just as real as my waking reality, and even had that smell of a fresh-cut lawn. 
And so what I gathered from that was that it was impossible to see that as any less real, any less substantial than my daily waking life. Sometimes the rules of physics are different in dreams, but nevertheless, they feel real. And the point he's also making there is that in dreams, we have some that are quite literal. They seem like they're logical. Other times they're filled with much more symbolism, right? They're filled with metaphoric meaning that we can still gather and understand. And so the perhaps shocking, certainly provocative thing he's saying here is what if our waking experience is more of the same? That most of our waking reality where we go around and we experience consistent kind of data is actually just when that particular dreamscape is rendering a certain way in a literal way. But there are other times, perhaps less common, where symbolic representations arise. And that might be what Joe Simonton is going through or these other kinds of absurd elements that actually, it's not so much that they are as absurd as they are symbolic and metaphorical. And that again, on top of that, maybe because we've been so convinced that the world is a certain way and it's this physical construct that's distinct from us, we've limited what we're exposed to. Is it perhaps a surprise that shamans and people from other cultures experience more? Or is it that they have an open-mindedness that allows them to see more of what's already there? How much are we blocking ourselves from the experience? I've even made the point to you before that what I would even suggest is that there are different, slightly different consensus realities around the world, depending on where you are. That part of the reason why you have more supposedly, quote unquote, supernatural things happening in some parts of the developing world is not because they just don't know any better, again, like our ancient forefathers who saw fairies, but because the coherent field of, of, of awareness that they collapse around them into manifest reality is slightly different than what it is here in North America. And again, to Bernardo's point and other people's points have made this argument, Valet as well, that perhaps what this is doing, if nothing else, is trying to shake us out of our stupor, wake us up to this larger reality. And these elements of the absurd are doing that. All right. So let me get to this one section that I think really again, makes the point that idealism is a really compelling way to look at this and that what if all of this is a dream? Quote, one may have reservations about the open-mindedness embodied in all the new and weird myths currently proliferating in physics, but the opposite attitude is a lot more pernicious and dangerous, apathy in face of the crumbling of a reigning worldview. Even among thinkers who accept that the current worldview is untenable, there seems to be a kind of cognitive split going on. Yes, they acknowledge the failure of the old paradigm, but they go on with their work and outlook as if nothing had changed. There is no concerted effort in society today to try to articulate the remarkable implications of the defeat of the present culturally sanctioned worldview. Were that to be done, it would change how we see the world how we do science, how we educate our children, and ultimately, how we live our lives. This is the real shame, for it turns our culture into a fossil, into a hardened shell that imprisons the imagination like an anthropod unable to molt. All we can assert about the reality of anything is its weak objectivity. Only for weak objectivity are there clear criteria for making such assertions. Based on these criteria, we can state that the calls of the absurd are weakly objective, and that is as much as can be said of anything, stars, mountains, chairs, photons, and history. Calls of the absurd cannot be asserted to be strongly objective, but then again, nothing can be asserted to be strongly objective, not only because there are no direct criteria for making such assertion, but because, as we have just seen, an overwhelming and still growing amount of scientific evidence indicates that strong objectivity is but an abstract figment of our conceptual imagination. Therefore, calls of the absurd are as real as anything. They are as much an inherent part of our condition as the consensus world surrounding us. It is ironic that science, through the diligent and consequent pursuit of a materialist, strongly objective view of nature, would lead to the very evidence that renders such view untenable. As we will later see, it is a recurring theme in different branches of science and philosophy that the pursuit of a rational system of thought ultimately leads to its own defeat. There is something perennial about the idea that any literal view of nature, when pursued to its ultimate ramifications, destroys itself from within. 
it is as though every literal model carried within itself the seeds of its own falsification, as if nature resisted attempts to be limited or otherwise boxed in. Whatever we say it is, it indicates it is not. Whatever we say it is not, it shows it might just be. These are built-in mechanisms of growth and renewal in nature that we ignore at our own peril. Nature is as fluid and elusive as a thought. Indeed, it is a thought, an unfathomable compound thought we live in and contribute to. The world is a shared dream. In it, as in a regular dream, the dreamer is himself the subject and the object, the observer and the observed. Unquote. Yeah, I mean, that drives home the point pretty clearly. And how does this change the way we experience uh, our own inner life, or our outer life, our relationships, it changes everything. Because instead of you know, us looking out at the world and saying, that world is separate and apart from what I know to be me, you look out at the world and say, that is, that is me. That is, that is a part of me. That you identify with what is taking place in your, in your observation as it being a part of who you are. The people that you that you love, the people that you meet, they're a part of you in, a, in an intimate, deep, deep way. And if, if you take that perspective, how does that change the way that you live and, and change our entire society? I mean, it changes it in a pretty dramatic and fundamental way. So I think this is um, you know, really kind of the maybe the, the ethical uh, sort of um, outcome of this perspective is that it really does – change the way that you you look at you know morality and and ethical decisions and you know who you are who you know you, what what actions you you take in the world and how those actions influence others as if it's um, something that you don't need to necessarily be concerned with you know I, I live my life and you live yours and we're just totally separated and that that's just how it is um, I live my life in, in here in the United States and there's another person that lives on the opposite side of the globe. We're not, we're not connected in any way, shape, or form, and, and that's totally fine. Instead of taking that perspective that we are all fundamentally connected in some way, uh, some way or another, it really does change the way we look at the entire enterprise. So uh, to me, it's, um, it's a very, very exciting way of looking at the world, and I think it's what we need right now. It's we, need, we need a perspective that really does shake us out of this kind of zombification that we found ourselves in which is the product of this, uh, you know, high scientism and physicalism that have brought us here. Absolutely. It's really compelling because what it does is it turns the way that we see the world on its head rather than reality being something that we want to crack, like a problem to solve. It becomes an adventure to pursue, to experience the experience is the point of the exercise altogether. And that, again, to your point, that by trying to separate our consciousness our perception from the world out there. And furthermore, to absurdly, you could argue, make the argument that we and our experience is just kind of a fluke, an accident, a sideline, secondary effect of what's going on in the natural world. When we've just pointed out with Bernardo's excellent logic that there's no way we can separate those two things to make such an assertion to begin with. And then you think about how the implications of that in terms of how we live our lives. And again, the collective insanity we're currently engaged in because of the implications of physicalism. It's not as if the physicalist model is itself the root of all the evils in the world, but it does contribute to them. When you make sense of your life and the point of existence altogether, that's going to bring about some very strange effects, and we are indeed seeing much of that. Now, the way that Bernardo finishes this book is really compelling because not only has he made the point about how the way we've seen reality is largely a product of bias and intuitions that are faulty, and that ironically, by using logic, you can eventually prove that the logic ultimately fails, which is very interesting. But he also goes on to talk about our obsession with technology. And he makes the point that it's very interesting because he spent much of his life in technology, as have I, as have you. But that actually what we see with these others is a kind of understanding that seems to transcend technology altogether, at least as we think about technology. And so the way he finishes the book is not only compelling and profound in terms of the implications for reality, but in terms of what may lie in our future, what we might discover about the nature of reality itself that would take us beyond technology, would transcend our notion of technology. Quoting from the book again, one final time, quote, 
Like actors who deeply internalize the experiences and emotions of their characters, we play our roles exceptionally well, so well, in fact, that it has become nearly impossible for us to transcend the plot. The movie has become a dream we seem unable to wake up from, but all is not lost. As Godel did, we can break the spell from within, exposing the untenability of any literal interpretation of the movie. We can be like a dreamer who looks in the mirror, sees a face different from his own, and exclaims in astonishment, It's a dream! This has been the exploratory attempt of this book. While we can expose the myth from within, we cannot access what lies beyond it unless we personally step out of the screen until we actually wake up from the dream, fleetingly as it may be. Godel showed that no formal system can consistently derive all truths about numbers, but this gave him no insight into those inaccessible truths. He could demonstrate that there is surely something beyond the horizon, but could not see what it is. Godel was, after all, a character inside the movie, a dreamer inside the dream. It is important, though, not to misconstrue the implications of the worldview we have developed here. This worldview does not imply that the ego consciousness we ordinarily experience and identify ourselves with can change reality at will, not even if we could completely control and focus our conscious thoughts. Such misinterpretation is based on the false but common premise that we are our egos. The implication of our articulation is instead that the psyche as a whole, conscious and unconscious parts, personal and collective parts, is the architect of reality. For as long as we are not aware of, and therefore have no explicit control over, what goes on in the unconscious depths of our mind, our ability to change reality will always be limited. It is the whole mountain chain of mind that creates reality not the ego-consciousness viewpoints of the islands. The latter are probably more like spectators than creators. Indeed, perhaps this is their very raison d'etre, the very reason why the islands exist and have come to forget what they were part of. Only through cosmological individuation, whereby the universal mind becomes explicitly cognizant of its true and complete self, can we truly realize our full potential as creators of the drama of existence. When we think of the future, we tend to imagine amazing new technologies that will vastly improve our lives and reach into the universe. Some of us even foresee that technology will enable us to live indefinitely and solve practically every problem society currently faces. As someone who has been involved in the development and deployment of new technologies most of his life, I have instinctive sympathy for such views. Yet in light of our discussion, they seem to overlook the elephant in the room. Without bivalence and realism, technology as we know it is an unnecessarily difficult, limited, and precarious way of going about realizing our aspirations as a society. Through technology, we build, with great difficulty, structures out of a limited set of predefined, cumbersome building blocks, while all along being intrinsically able to create whatever customized building blocks we want. But we ignore this latter possibility and take great pride in our strenuous efforts to wrestle with nature. Indeed, technology as we know it represents the leveraging of the laws of logic and physics as they currently exist. Yet the ultimate technology is the leveraging of mind, the fountainhead of the world, the origin of all logic and physics. If only we could learn to gain mastery of our mind, conscious and unconscious, unfathomable new possibilities would open up before us. Could other civilizations, beyond our knowledge or ability to conceive of, have reached the mastery of the technologies of mind? If so, what could their relationship to us be? More importantly, how could we make steps towards the mastery of such technologies ourselves? Unquote. Bravo. Um, yeah, <laughs> I couldn't agree more. And um, I, I appreciate how he addresses in those paragraphs this notion that you common hear from commonly hear from those who are skeptical of about the idealist position that well why not just everybody uh you know imagine that um you know chocolate tastes like oranges you know and we just all collectively decide that and that's what it's going to taste like and he he's arguing that it doesn't quite work in that way um uh, because that that's sort of um the intention that we would be putting in play there would be coming from our egoic consciousness that that really superficial uh, surface layer of consciousness, but really the creative force of reality is much deeper than that. 
at that, that really subconscious level. And for us to be able to really leverage that, like he says, in a technological capacity, to leverage the technology of the mind at that depth of experience, if we could do that, then yes, we could, in fact, change the landscape of what reality lo looks like, including you know physics itself, how things behave, etc. Um, it's it's quite a bold claim. I know there are going to be a lot of folks that may have difficulty re wrestling with that, but um, you sort of have to look at it in, in its totality. And and we skipped over quite a lot of the book toward you know towards the end, uh, where he goes into more detail about some of the archetypes of of consciousness and kind of how they emerge in, in reality. So again, very much recommend reading the entire text. But absolutely, this is a wonderful place to land because, you know, for you and I, for those that are interested in the, in the, in the topic that we speak on so often, this particular landing point really does kind of drive the point home that what if what we're experiencing in, the, in what we call the phenomena is really maybe part and parcel to, you know, pointing towards the deeper reality of its, itself, but also to, you know, perhaps beings that have, in fact, mastered a kind of technology of the mind, and thus they have a capability of doing things that you and I would, would, would say are, you know, literally impossible. But for them, it's just as simple as walking through a doorway, which is just easy enough for us to do anytime we want. Absolutely. I find his argument really compelling. I remember when you and I had a conversation at Starbucks again a couple of years ago, and it was kind of a revelation to me, and it fit with some of the downloads, again, if you want to call it that, that I had, and even some visions I had, it suddenly made a lot of sense. It all fit together. And it led me to calling these beings intermentationals, if you remember, and that this intermentational hypothesis that I was forming was this notion that, yes, this all happens in mind. And then when you think about channeled material, like, for instance, the raw contact channeled material, they talk about basically, as you proceed through different stages of consciousness, your very relationship with reality changes. And you ask yourself the question, why would that be? Well, it's because it's not ultimately physical. It's mentational. It's a thought. And as you become more conscious within the dream, you become one of the architects of the dream. So to some extent, when we think about whether it's the extraterrestrial hypothesis or even the interdimensional hypothesis, the notion there is that, again, if it's another parallel physical universe, right, and they're just moving back and forth, the assumption is still based around physicalism. But the point here is that Bernardo makes his point really, really well. This not only is idealism a better fit for reality than physicalism, and as we've said many times, physicalism is not even tenable at this point, but it also makes so much sense of the UFO phenomenon. Suddenly everything fits within that, that as you become more conscious of your experience, like having a lucid dream, if you will, then you can choose to do things. I remember that experience myself becoming lucid in a dream and deciding, I want to go left instead of right. I wonder what's over that hill and I can go explore it. I can even then, you can imagine, get to the point where I populate trees in a certain section. I start moving through things just because I will it as part of the dream. So this is fascinating. And again, what I think it does is it brings back the centrality of human experience and conscious experience. And then we begin to ask deeper questions such as, if this is a dream, what is the point? Is this source consciousness exploring itself in all these different permutations that we ourselves, as I've said many times, may be fractal impressions of source consciousness? I would argue we are. So I sort of take Bernardo's work and take it several steps beyond. And once you do that, you very interestingly end up again right where ancient pedantic thought was 5,000 years ago. As I said to you before we went on the air, isn't it interesting that it took quantum mechanics at the very edge of physicalism to establish that Nothing physical is really physical. It's more like fields and energies and things like that and takes it exactly back to what these people knew 5,000 years ago. And they didn't have the ability to do the double slit experiment 5,000 years ago, which speaks to the fact that sometimes at a really deep layer of awareness through things like meditation and other kind of protocols, we can transcend the usual daily waking experience, the conditioned mind that Don Hoffman talks about and actually experience reality at a deeper layer of the cake, or to use Bernardo's analogy, go below the mountains, right below the islands that are above the water, and go deeper. And from there, you see reality as it is, as a kind of noetic knowing. It's a direct knowledge. And I think the fact that quantum mechanics is taking us to the exact same place that these people understood as the 
revelatory aspects of reality 5,000 years ago is telling us something we should not ignore. Amen to that. Um, this has been a great episode. I've really enjoyed this conversation. And there's so much more to really get into outside of the, the book. Of course, we could have talked about more of the content as well, but just the implications, ramifications of the book itself on on the study of UFOs and, and the phenomena. Uh, and I, th- I hope we get a chance to do that because it does greatly complexify the situation. And I think for those of you who are, are really new to the topic and maybe just thinking, hey, this might be extraterrestrials and that might be the end of it, uh, your heads are going to be spinning quite a bit because it, it gets far more complicated than that. And the implications that that we arrive at from this book, from from the ideas in this book, really are profound in, in how we understand ourselves and reality itself. So I hope we get a chance to have that conversation. Really enjoyed this one. I um, hope all of you enjoyed listening to it as well. Thanks a bunch for all of the comments that we had uh, from the last episode. It was really great to uh, to hear from all of you, and, and your participation in the chat was uh, was really great. All right. Well, um, may the quality of our questions shaped by a desire for understanding enhance our journey of discovery, and may our travels broaden the sphere of our consciousness, reminding us that new discoveries beget new horizons. As always, adventure awaits. We'll see you next time on Liminal Frames.